I praise God for the privilege of coming before you again. Remember, we start a new series. What's our new series? Known by love, love rediscovered. Why is this so important? How to love? Do you recall, historically speaking, years ago, there was a man by the name of Mahatma Gandhi. How many of you have heard of that name? Mahatma Gandhi. He was the leader of India. But many people don't know the history of what he went through when he was young. He was sent to London to study law. Upon graduation from law, he was so enamored with Christianity because in London, he was able to go to libraries. He was amazed when he had a chance to read the gospel, the entire New Testament. He was amazed when Jesus taught his disciples, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. In his mind, this is amazing. So he really admired Jesus. So when he graduated, he went to South Africa to practice law. He decided to continue his investigation of Jesus. So he visited a church. Now when he went to the church, this is what shocked you, what will shock you, what will shock me. He was not allowed to enter the church. They asked him, why are you coming to our church? He said, well, I want to learn more about Christianity. I want to learn more about Jesus. They said, sorry, you cannot come. The reason he cannot come is because the color of his skin. And you know how he processed this? Everybody read, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. You know, many of you have come to Christ because of the kindness of Christians. There are many good Christians, but there are also many so-called Christians who don't act like Christ. And nothing has turned off people from Christianity more than Christians. And yet, nothing attracts them more to Jesus more than Christians. My burden is that all of us will understand what does it mean to be a Christian. That's why in CCF, we don't use the term Christian. We don't say, are you a Christian? Do you know why? For many people, Christianity is somebody who goes to church. For many people, Christianity is a religion. I'm not a Muslim, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Buddhist, I'm a Christian. I'm not a Hindu, I'm a Christian. Uh -uh. We call ourselves in CCF, what do we call ourselves? Disciples. Christ committed followers. So I ask people, are you a Christ committed follower? Why? Because a true Christian is a Christ committed follower. But the problem is this. Many people are not disciples. Many people are not trained. One of our burdens is to teach people what does it mean to be a true Christian. Remember, I'm warning all of you, don't be discouraged when you hear people or you hear Christians committing sin, falling into immorality. You know why? For all you know, they may not be real Christians. Now, it is possible for a real Christian to fall into sin. It's possible. But one thing I'm going to tell you, you and I, we need to grow to become more Christ-like. Therefore, do you want to know what the early historians have to say about Christians? Do you know how they described Christians years ago? First century, second century. This is how they describe Christians. This is written by Aristides. Aristides was a philosopher. He was a Greek. And he wrote this letter in Athens to the Roman emperor in defense of Christianity. You see, this guy studied Hinduism, Judaism, 
He's a scholar. And he was so amazed at Christianity. And this is why he supported Christianity. Let us look at what he wrote. Christians have the commands of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah himself, etched into their hearts. In other words, as believers, we understand the command of Jesus. They do not engage in adultery or sexual immorality. They do not bear false witness. Neither do they covet that which belongs to others. Everybody read. They love their neighbors. Next, he said, they comfort those who injure them. Remember, Jesus tells us, treat others the way you want them to treat you. Even trying to win them over as their friends, they're eager to do good to their enemies. That is how Christians are known for. They abstain from all impurity. They neither neglect the widow nor oppress the orphan. If you look at church history, you will discover it was Christian who started orphanages. Children were left to die. If they don't like the sex, they want a boy, it's a girl, they let it die. Christians started adopting orphans. It was Christians who started hospitals. That's why you look at the hospitals all over the world. Many of them about Samaritan, St. John's Hospital, St. Peter's Hospital. These are all started by Christians because of their love for one another. So my question to you is simply this today. What are we known for? What are you known for? Remember I asked you to ask your neighbor, ask your neighbor, am I known for what? What do you think? What will they say? Well, today I want to help you understand our topic because I like what Francis Schaeffer said. He's a great author. Francis Schaeffer said, everybody read, love is the final apologetic. In short, if you want to defend Christianity, if you want to defend Christ, it's called apologetics. You are an apologist. You defend. He said, it is the defense for which there is no offense. What is our final apologetic, everybody? Love. You love people, and I guarantee you, it will impact their lives. May not be immediate, but sooner or later, it will impact their lives. This is so crucial. I'd like you to know, Jesus made it so clear. Do you know how many commandments are there in the Bible? How many commandments? Moses gave us how many? Then, the Jews, the rabbis, complicated it. They made it into 613 commandments. 365, what you must not do. 248, what you must do. No wonder my friend who was Jewish, not a Christian, he's from Israel, and I, you know, we used to go to Israel every year, I asked him, why are you not religious? Because Jewish people, many are religious. He said, Peter, I cannot keep up with the commandments. It's so complicated. In short, he said, I cannot be good enough for God to accept me. So many commandments. You know what Jesus did? He simplified it. How many commandments? Two. What are the two greatest commandments? Number one, according to Jesus. Let's read together. Somebody asked Jesus, what commandment is the greatest? Jesus answered, this is the foremost, the greatest. Everybody read. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you the two greatest commandments are all interrelated. What's the greatest commandment, everybody? Love God with all your heart, 
soul, mind, and strength. If you love God, the Bible tells you, you will love one another. Let me repeat. If you love God, you will love one another. If you love God, you will not cheat your neighbor, you will not commit adultery, you will not lie, because you love God. If you don't love God, everything's a problem. If you love God, coming to worship isn't a problem. Coming on time isn't a problem. It won't be an inconvenience because you love God. If you don't love God, everything is a problem. Attending Bible study is a problem. Everything has to do with love. You know, love is the greatest motivation. There are things you will do that you will never do apart from love. I read the story of this guy from the Netherlands. He was courting a girl. You know how old is a girl? 78. You know how old is a man? 80. Oh, how do you court a girl 78 years old? Something like that. <laughs> you know, the girl fell in love with this man. And this man gave her one condition. I will marry you on one condition. Her name is Aleida. Aleida, you stop smoking. You know, Aleida loved Leo. Leo is the name of the guy. You know what Aleida said? What willpower cannot do. I tried to quit smoking all my life. I could not do it. But because of love, I did it. Imagine that. My friend, if you love, ano anong sabihin sa Tagalog? If there's a will, there's a way? Yes or no? If there is love, will there be a way? Yes. If there's no love, my friend, you analyze your own life. You analyze your children. If you love, can you do it? Yes. So the topic today is so simple. Remember, we are starting a new series. What's the name of our series? Love Rediscovered. Why do we need to rediscover love? Because everybody don't really understand love. Young people, you love to love. Old people, you love to love. Up to now, we're still looking for love. The problem is this. We are disappointed because we do not know what is true love. Yes or no? If you are a normal person, okay, assuming you're normal, how many, how many of you really like to be loved? Raise your hand. Oh, you see, you're normal. Pag hindi ka nagtaas ng kamay, mental hospital. How many of you like to love? Raise your hand. You know, somebody once said the greatest blessing, the second greatest blessing is to be loved. The greatest blessing is to love. I submit to you, the greatest blessing is to experience the unconditional love of God. That's to me the greatest blessing. And the second greatest blessing is to love others the way God wants you to love. You know, love is an amazing word. Amen? So today, are you ready as we continue our series? What's our series today? Today, it's about love is action. Say that with me. Love is action. Last Sunday, what did we discuss? Love from the words of Jesus. Today, we will discuss love as understood by the Apostle Paul. Next Sunday, we will talk about love based on the different apostles, according to John, according to Peter, according to James. You understand? All the New Testament are written by people who are followers of Jesus, and they will tell us, and I want you to learn what love is all about. How many of you need to grow in love? You want to learn to love more. Raise your hands. Aha, wonderful. Now, do you know why I gave you these handouts? How many of you have this? Wave this at me. Wave, wave. Higher. How many of you don't have this? Raise your hands. I'm going to give this to you. You don't have this. Raise your hands. Higher. Ushers, can you give to these people who don't have this? Because this is something that will help you because we are going to learn together. You don't have this. If you don't have this, raise your hand. Okay? Yeah, and somebody will give it to you, okay? So we have people here in front. They don't have the handouts. In the meantime, I want to share with you, last Sunday, just quick reminder, okay? Last Sunday, according to Jesus, what is love? Do you recall last Sunday? Remember what Jesus said in John 13? Quickly, last Sunday, 
Jesus tells us, a new commandment I give you, you love one another as I have loved you. So Jesus gave them a commandment to love others as I love you. That is what is new. The command to love is not new. It's in the Old Testament. But the command to love as Jesus loved, that's the standard. It's new. And what is that standard? Love one another as I have loved you. Let's read this together. You love one another even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. According to Jesus, the best test of Christianity is love. How? As I love you. How did Jesus love us? Well, remember, what is love? Love is a commitment. Say that with me. Love is a commitment. Next, directed towards imperfect people to seek the highest good, which is costly and may require sacrifice. That is the love that I like you to understand. If people ask you what is love, you must tell them love is a unconditional commitment. It's not feeling. It transcends feeling towards imperfect people to seek their highest good, not your own good, their highest good, which oftentimes, everybody read, is costly and may require sacrifice. Today, I'm going to teach you now how is this love expanded, okay? Because love is a commitment. So what kind of commitment must you do? My goodness. Today, the topic is one simple word. Love is action. 1 Corinthians 13 has 15 verbs about love. And I will explain that to you. So let's begin by the introduction of what is most important. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. Verses 1, 2, 3. Let's read that together. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What Paul is saying, if you have the gift of communication, you are so good in communicating, but you don't have love, it's nothing. He continues, if I have the gift of prophecy, and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith as to remove mountains, can you imagine this amazing gift, the gift of knowledge, the gift of faith, able to remove mountains but do not have love? What did he say? I am nothing. Huh. What are you now learning? I call this the myth of spirituality. There are seven myths of spirituality that I want to debunk. What do I mean? Many people think I am spiritually mature if I have the following. I want to share with you, based on these verses, I'm going to go back. I will tell you that is not true. What are the myths? Many people do not understand what does it mean to be a spiritually mature person. I think all of you, you like to grow. Yes or no? Do you want to grow spiritually? Yes or no? All right. What is your target? How do you know you are growing? Let me now tell you what it is not. Number one, the myth of knowledge. Many people think, if I have a lot of Bible knowledge, I'm spiritual. You know what the Bible says? Knowledge makes you proud. Uh -uh. So knowledge does not equal spiritual maturity. Some people say, zeal. You know, I, I'm zealous. I want to serve God. Excuse me. Zealousness does not mean you are spiritually mature. Activities. You know, some people are very busy. You volunteer here, you volunteer there. You are a sir, you are serving God left and right. Uh-uh. That does not mean you are spiritually mature. Some people think success. Look at my business. God must love me. I'm so mature. Look at my ministry. Look at my discipleship group. So many of them. Not exactly. What about position? Look at my position in the church. Just because you have position does not mean you are spiritually mature. But many people strive for position. Spiritual gifts. 
Ah, the one we read a, a while ago, I have the gift of speaking in tongues. I have the gift of faith. Ah, what about sacrifice? Okay, I will show you that verse. Since it's part of 1 Corinthians 13. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Sacrifice. Everybody read this. If I give all my possessions, not some, all, savings account, checking account, all. If you give all to feed the poor, if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me what? Nothing. My friend, God is very, very emphatic. What you do is important, but why you do it is even more important. If you do things without love, God is saying that's nothing. Nothing wrong with feeding the poor. Nothing wrong with being generous. But God is saying it's nothing because God looks at the heart. So may I ask you, everything you are doing today, is it the result of because you love the Lord, you love Jesus. My friend, if you don't do it because you love Jesus, it is nothing. God is saying your highest motivation should be love. Love Jesus, yes or no? Do you love Jesus? You love one another? All right. Love is action. So tell your neighbor, God loves me and I love you. Tell your neighbor, God loves me and I love you. Now, this time you look at your neighbor in the eyes and you tell them, really, I love you with the love of Christ. I love you. Okay, do you love each other? Honestly, when you turn to your neighbor, okay, turn to your neighbor one more time. Tell your neighbor, I really love you. Now, how do you feel? How do you feel? You feel good or you feel angry? You know, even by just saying the word, I love you, does it impact you? Louder. You see the power of action? Everybody, what's the topic today? Love is action. Love is not a concept. Love is not just an idea. Love is not just thinking or feeling. That's what many people think. Uh-uh. Love is action. Tell your neighbor, love is action. Don't just keep talking about love. You act it out. I love this quotation from this famous writer. His na- he, he talks about love is useless unless you act it out. Look, let us look at what Jer- David Jeremiah has to say. Everybody read this. Love is worthless unless it is expressed in deed and behavior. So 1 Corinthians 13 is very famous when it comes to describing what love is. So are you ready? All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's begin. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Before we continue, let me just tell you the big picture of what love is. Love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, has 15 verbs. If you look at the English version, you think they're adjectives. You may think it's a, it's a noun. It is not an adjective, it's not a noun. These are 15 action words. Example, love is patient. In the original language, patient is an action word. It is in the present continuous tense, meaning love is patient. Not once a week, not once a month, it is always patient. So shall I explain that to you now? For you to understand 1 Corinthians 13, I want you to imagine now a beautiful flower that was given to me and to my wife. Thank you. 
it's, it's a young lady from CCF. They gave us you know, nice flowers. By the way, I gave my wife uh, a dozen red roses. But this member gave us, wow, a dozen white roses. And her roses are bigger than, honey, sorry, it's bigger, but uh, you know I love you. Guys, listen to me. First Corinthians 13 is like a picture. It's like a flower about love. If you remove each one of them by itself, love is patient, love is kind, you will not appreciate the beauty of love. It's composite. Understand? Love is not just patient. It is kind. Do you understand? You got to look at it as a whole, and that's what I want to do with you today. See it as a big picture of what love is. Are you ready? How many verbs? Fifteen. I'm going to explain now. One by one. Are you ready? All right. By the way, this is like the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The only way you can love this, according to my wife and according to my own experience, is supernatural. I cannot love properly without the love of Christ in us. And that's why you need the Holy Spirit. Look at the Holy Spirit. First, uh, look at Galatians chapter 5. Together, let's read this. Together. The fruit of the Spirit. Do you know this? Singular. The fruit. It's one composite fruit. Com combination. What is in that fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the work of God's Spirit. You know why I'm excited to share this with you? Because I need to grow spiritually. I need to grow in love. And I want to give you the good news. You cannot live the Christian life in your own power. It's impossible. You need Christ. And every time we meet together, I'm telling you, the secret is, are you willing to surrender your weaknesses to Jesus and let him turn your weaknesses to become blessings as you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? So are you ready? Yes, you can clap. Praise God. Now, ready, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to number one. Love is patient. Look at that verse. From the Greek word makrothumia. Notice two Greek words. Makro means long. Tomeo means what? Suffering. So what is patient? Love is long suffering. What does that mean? Love is long suffering. My friend, listen to me. It's easy to be patient for one second. <laughs> but long suffering, I remember the story of this man. He was going to the grocery, and there was this little boy in the cart. That little boy was so rowdy, throwing stuff out of the cart, he would put it back. And then he kept talking. Okay, you know what he was saying? Donald, take it easy. Donald, take it easy. <laughs> Donald, keep calm. Donald, we got this, Donald. So the mothers around him, when they were in the check-in counter, were so impressed. They really felt like he was such a good, you are such a good father. So they knelt down and talked to the boy. Donald, how are you? The father said, He's not Donald. He's Henry. I am Donald. <laughs> the father was talking to himself. Take it easy. Be calm. You know, the truth is this. Love is what? Patient. But you've got to combine patience with kindness. Look at kindness. Look at that word. Kindness means what? The word kind is from this word, kresteomai. The Christians were noted not just for patience. Patience can be passive. But you add on kindness. Let me give you an example. We have a CCF member who got the shock of her life when he discovered something about her husband. You see, her husband studied in the States. 
in a great Christian university, very famous. The family were Christians. The family were leaders of churches. But when she married him, she thought he was a real Christian to discover he was a womanizer. He drinks. So he left and went to the States to rethink through. Because maybe you women can identify with him. Many women will say, you can do a lot of things, but the moment you commit adultery, the moment I catch you being unfaithful, that's it. I'm out of here. Many women make that mental vow. And she was rethinking what she should do. She called my wife. And by the grace of God, she decided, I'm going to forgive him. She flew back. And when she came back, she applied what true love is. Not just patience, but kindness. What do I mean kindness? She prepared his food. She was nice to him. The most painful thing was this. She discovered he built another house. A new house for the mistress. So this guy has another family. I don't know about you women. What will you do? Love is what? Louder. Love is? Long suffering. Love is kind. You know what made her kind? She told my wife, this is probably the only side of heaven he will experience. Because when he dies, it will be hell for him. So he, she decided to be as nice as possible. Because for her, this is the nicest side of heaven he can ever imagine. Now remember, she has her own family with her husband. But you know, she was so nice that the husband asked her, can I bring the two girls from my mistress here? You know, I don't know about you ladies, but you know what? She was so nice. She was nice to those girls who are not hers. And then she was so nice that they slept with them in the same room. And you know what those two young girls said to her eventually? She said, you are a real mother to us. You are, a more, you are more mother than our mother. But you know, make a long story short, this man developed cancer. And I've always tell people, don't wait for cancer to wake up. But God used cancer to wake him up. I visited him in Medical City. And he told me, Peter, should God allow me to live a bit longer? I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to do what you are doing. The guy really changed. God allowed him to live a little longer. He invited his drinking mate. He invited people that he know. You know why? He said, I don't want to go to heaven alone. Apparently, the Holy Spirit convicted him. Would you believe it? When he died, the other family came. And would you believe it? The other family is attending church now. Only God can do it. Amen? Because of the kindness. Kindness of this girl. Now, what made her kind? Only the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this on your own. So what have we learned about love? Love is patient. Love is kind. Can you rate yourself? So what are you? So you put there, if you are like Jesus, check number seven. If you are like the devil, put there one. <laughs> love is patient. Okay, check. I want you to apply this at home today so that you can improve. You, you find out which one you need to improve. Now think of your family members. When I say love is patient, love is kind, i like you to think of the following faces. Face number one. Okay? Lovable. Nice. See, that's my wife. 
No problem. Check seven, seven. I am patient. I am kind. What about some people are neutral? Yes or no? What about some people you avoid? Are these your neighbor? Are these your family members? What about this one? Annoying. How about this one? <laughs> now, are you not thinking of people around your family? Now, these are the people you're going to come in contact with. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Who are the neighbors in your house? Which one? Just, don't, don't look at them. Just look at me. Now, what must you do with them? Love is action. Okay, say that with me. Love is action. What kind of action? Be kind. Be patient. Now, what is love not? There are eight things the Bible says what love is not, what you should never do. Are you ready? All right. Let's read. Love is not what? Jealous. Love is not, does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Let me explain. That word jealous comes from the word zealous. It's like you are boiling. You know why? Let me tell you. There is a kind of jealousy that's good. There's a kind of jealousy that's not wrong. A jealousy that is acceptable, that is good. Example, when God says, God is a jealous God. It is to protect us. Because when you read the word jealous, referring to God, it always has to do with our heart for idols. Why is God so protective of you? Because when you worship idols, you are going to destroy yourself. Idolatry is one sin, just like any other sin, that will ultimately destroy you. It gives you temporal solution to your problems. For some people, their idol is money. For some people, their idol is pleasure. Whatever it is to make you happy. But my friend, it's a disaster. A jealousy between husband and wife. That's healthy. Nothing wrong with that. It's protective. But this jealousy that is bad, you can translate it as envious. Example, let me ask you a question. Which is easier? According to Romans, weep with those who weep Weep or rejoice with those who rejoice? What do you think? If you see your neighbor having a nicer car, if you see somebody having a bigger business, are you happy for them or are you not happy? If you ask me, it's easier to weep with those who weep. It is harder to rejoice with those who are successful. Yes or no? I learned this personally years ago. When people will come to me and tell me, you know, Peter, do you know that church nearby is growing faster than CCF? Do you know that other church is growing faster than CCF? In my heart, I have to confess, I have some kind of, I feel like they are criticizing me. And then the Lord spoke to me. The Lord said, next time, if people come to you and say, this church is growing, this church is very good, you know what I did? From that day onward, when people come to me, I say, praise God. I praise God for that church. You are describing to me, that church is a good church. Bless that church. You can go there. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to go there. I'm just telling you, it's a good church. But my whole attitude changed. You see, we have to have kingdom mentality in my mind. When others are doing well, bless them. That's the meaning. You are not jealous. You are not envious. I've learned in my life to really be happy for the success of other people. It's not easy. In the past, I feel like I need to own it to be happy. I need to own this. I realize I don't have to own this. Years ago, my wife met this amazing couple. He's a billionaire. He's based in London. He has donated over 300 million U.S. dollars to God's work. So this guy said, multi, multi millionaire. He invited me, and I was shocked. After landing in the airport, he took me to his private plane. So from the airport, we have to take another private plane to an island. Have you tried riding? amazing private jet plane 
48,000 to 50,000 feet above sea level, quiet. And then you have stewardess serving you, your own pilot, your own chair. Man, I told my wife, this is really nice, better than first class. But you know what? It's not mine. Am I enjoying it? Yes, you know why? Because I really cannot afford it, okay? But more than that, I've learned to be happy for him. Then he took me to a yacht. My goodness, the yacht is almost 200 feet long. So many rooms. You have cook, you have stewardess to take care, you have captain, and you have jet ski all over. And you know what? I don't own it, but did I enjoy it? As I'm telling you, are you becoming jealous with me now? Or are you happy for me? Be happy for me, okay? Be happy. You know why? I'm trying to tell you we need to learn to be joyful with the blessing of others. Amen? All right. So turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I'm so glad you have a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> okay. Next. What does it say? Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Notice, this brag has the idea of blow. You blow. Mahangin ka. My friend, true love does not want to brag. I'm not criticizing politicians, but do you notice politicians, when they build a bridge, when they build a road, what do they do? Do they put their name there? Yes or no? Now let me ask you, whose money are they using? Taxpayers' money. Why do they put their name? You see? My friend, I remember a young leader years ago in CCF. He was so disappointed. The only reason I knew it, because his wife was angry. Because in some of these gatherings, he was not recognized as probably his work was not recognized by omission, whatever. You know, I talked to this man. I said, be careful that you don't serve God because you want to be recognized. Just because you are not recognized and you feel angry tells me something. Not you, but your wife. You see, you got to check your motive. You don't brag. You serve God because you love Him. Amen? So tell your neighbor, you serve God because you love Him. Okay? So that's love. Do you see love is action? Say that with me. Love is action. Love is not bragging. Love is not jealous. And love is what? It's not arrogant. Why do you have to be proud? Can I tell you something? The older I become, the more I realize everything we have is from God. One of my friends owns a bank. I mean, this guy is a millionaire, major stockholder of a bank. One day, he fell in his bathroom, hit his head on the back, went into coma, never recovered. You know what hit me? God can take anything away from us overnight. Think about it. You think you are in control. You think you are, you are the one who did everything. You know, Deuteronomy is a very good verse to warn all of you. Okay, everybody read this together. If you are, if you are tempted to become proud, because you know, there are many kinds of pride. Educational pride, material pride, uh, Bible pride. You know, you think you know better. Look at this verse, everybody. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses, many of you have more than one house, then your heart will become proud. You may say in your heart, my power, the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God. It is He who is giving you the power to make wealth. May I remind all of you, nothing to be proud of. Amen? Everything you have, every talent you have is from the Lord. Yes or no? And I tell all pastors, even ministry, CCF is a gift from God for you and for me to serve. God can take CCF away anytime. Yes or no? So please, love is not arrogant. Let's continue. What else can we learn about love? Love, you, you group this together. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Let's understand. What does it mean? Does not 
act unbecomingly. You know, to act unbecomingly, there's a Tagalog word for this. It's called B-A-S-T-O-S. What is acting unbecomingly? Bastos. You are impolite. You are disrespectful. In, in, in Tagalog, dadabog, dabog ka sa harap ng tao. In English, you are daybog, daybog. <laughs> now, what does that mean? You know, I praise God for my wife. My wife tells our children, you cannot ever use your menstrual cycle as an excuse to be impolite. Don't allow hormones to take over your behavior. In other words, you must always act politely, wisely. Don't be rude. You know, it's shocking today. People today are no longer polite. We walk out on people. We shout. We are rude. We don't understand basic etiquette. The Bible says, love does not act unbecomingly. My friend, I pray that we will learn to love the way God wants us to love. Love does not act what? Unbecomingly. I want to prove to you that's within your control. Example, you're having a dinner. And then you got irritated. And you want to make debug, debug. Debug, debug. But then suddenly you discover you have a guest. Who is the guest? Oh, the president of the Philippines. Oh, what will you do? Will you suddenly behave? Now, wife, be careful. Don't ever say this because I've heard many wives. Oh, what will you do if Peter is here? Don't use me. I'm not Jesus. Wait, because if you keep saying, oh, what will, what will you do if Konandita si Peter? You know what? Your husband will hate me. And I'm not Jesus. My friend, always ask yourself, Jesus is here. What will I do? You don't act unbecomingly. What else? You don't act unbecomingly. You don't seek your own. You know what is even seeking your own? Seeking your own is really, you want it your way. You know, my wife was counseling a wife of a leader. I cannot tell you where or when. Don't think. Just take my word for this. This lady was giving her husband a lot of issues. But I will assure you, not here, okay? So don't worry. Not here. So don't, 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 don't think. Not in the main. So don't worry. Don't, don't y- y- stop thinking already. <laughs> now, my wife said, you know, you know, I praise God for my wife. She's very insightful. She said, based on your problem, because it's husband and wife counseling, based on what you are telling us, it seems you will never ever be happy until your husband will totally do what you want him to do. She thought about it, and she smiled. <laughs> I said, can you imagine you want your husband to really completely submit to you? My friend, don't be selfish. Are you willing to surrender your rights? You see, love is not insisting. I got to do it my way. You know, I'm sudden. The other day, I was having time with some of my old friends. These are my old classmates. Can you imagine 65 years ago? So, so I, I'm not that old, but that's, that's reality. He was telling me, Peter, I don't understand some of our friends. So he's referring to old friends. I said, what do you mean? Peter, I don't understand. They are Christians. Why are they suing each other? You know my answer? Just because you're a Christian does not mean you'll act like Christ. It saddens me because I know these people. When he mentioned the names, I know all of them. Friends, if you refuse to surrender your rights, we'll always be fighting people. Oh, pastor, what will happen to me? I'll be a doormat. People will walk all over me. Excuse me. Can I tell you something? God promised to protect you, yes or no. Do you realize there are reasons why God allows you to be taken advantage of? Because God is after your character. God wants to mold your character. So he's allowing these things to happen. But I'm going to tell you, someday the day will come when God 
will vindicate you. Yes or no? In the meantime, what is love? Love is patient, long suffering. Love is what? Kind. You be kind. And then what is the reverse? You are not jealous. You don't brag. You don't look at what it says here. You don't act unbecomingly. You don't seek your own. You are not provoked. The word provoke is from the root word pain, sharp. You, 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 you are suddenly provoked. You know what makes you suddenly get angry? When you feel disrespected. Think about it. My wife and I were having lunch with a distinguished gentleman. And for me, it's a small thing. That distinguished gentleman got so angry with the waitress. He banged the table. We were both shocked. Bah! And he started shouting. And I saw the wife, four of us. We were just incredulous. Can I tell you, if you feel disrespected, you react. I pray that that girl will never know that he's a Christian, okay? Because he's a Christian. But I realize Christians, you do get provoked if you are not careful. So you need to practice this. That's why I want you, when you go home, by the way, are you, are you rating this? Okay, let's, let's rate it now, okay? So how are you doing? Not jealous, you don't brag, you're not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek your own, you are not provoked. Are you easily provoked? Do you have a bad temper? That's right, this thing. You have a short fuse? Yes or no? Don't raise your hand. Just smile at me. <laughs> Guilty. All right. You need to repent. You need to repent. You know why? That's not love. My friend, I tell you something. You can only do this if you love God. If you love God, you love people. And if you love people, you'll be nice to people. Yes or no? I tell you. When you were courting your girlfriend, how many of you are married already? Raise your hand. May asawa na kayo. Sorry, ah. Too late, ah. Yung, ba, single ba? Okay. Those of you who are married, you need to practice this at home. You know the hardest person to practice this with? Who? Who? Your wife. Provoke. Is she provoking you now? Be careful. All right. Can I give you simple suggestions how to overcome provocation? Once you surrender your life to Jesus, and then suddenly you are angry, for example, your wife says something or somebody says something, okay, I, I will teach you practice. Okay, copy me. Do this. Forefinger and thumb. Okay, are you doing this? Now, put this over your lips. And then squeeze it. Now, everybody, practice now. For all of you, close your mouth. That's what you do. When you are irritated, what must you do? What? What do you do? You try it. When you are provoked, what must you do? Okay, you don't have to be obvious. You know, in the restaurant, they think you're crazy. <laughs> but I tell you something. I have tried it many times. I keep quiet. When I keep quiet, and then nice thing you do. Look at me. Take a deep breath. Exhale. Kung galit ka pa, deep breath. And then go to the toilet. Okay? If you need to go to the toilet, can I tell you something? You'll be amazed. Shut your mouth. After a few seconds, a few minutes, you think about it. Certain things are not worth fighting over. Surrender that to God. You pray. When my wife will shut her mouth, you know what she's going to do now? Pray. When I shut my mouth, I pray. Okay with you? All right. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. My goodness. This is where you have the word logistics, logistomai. You know, many people, you are like an accountant. You mark down the time when your husband or your wife make a mistake, right? No, the Bible says you don't take an account. You don't keep an account. You know what? You forgive, you let go. Somebody was attending a marriage seminar and men, men, women, women, and we were discussing, and the men said, you know, my wife becomes hysterical 
when something goes wrong. And then the other guy said, Suerte, Carl, you're lucky. She's only hysterical. Mine is historical. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to be historical. Another guy said, you're lucky, historical. Mine is an archaeologist. <laughs> you keep digging the past. My friend, may I suggest, is stop recording. You know, the truth is this. I'm going to make mistake. I'm going to make mistake. Forgive. You know, God tells us in the Bible, God tells us your sins. I will remember no more. You know, I really praise God for my family. I praise God for my wife. When my wife forgives me, she doesn't bring up the past. You know, I've done a lot of stupid things, which I'm ashamed of, which I think is really sinful. But you know, my wife, when she forgives, that's it. In our family, we don't repeat. What about you? Do you keep repeating? You see, my friend, from the Bible, love, read, does not take into account. Okay. As we finish, let's look. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. What does it mean? You don't rejoice with unrighteousness. Meaning, you don't gossip. When you see something wrong, you don't have to rejoice. But learn to rejoice with the truth. You know, most of us get excited when somebody does something wrong or you hear something wrong, you want to tell others, please don't do that. You know why the Bible tells us love covers a multitude of sin. Are you familiar with that verse? Well, keep fervent in your love for one another Love covers a multitude of sins. It is not saying you condone sin. It means you forgive. However, when I see you doing something wrong, what, what will I do? I will not embarrass you. I will talk to you privately. I don't exaggerate it. You must learn what true love is. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. I'm begging all of you, CC efforts. When you see other churches, other Christians having problems, do not exaggerate it or talk about it in the Facebook. It's not our business. You see some other churches having problems, you talk to their pastors privately, but don't broadcast it. What in the world will you contribute by putting that in Facebook? What are you trying to accomplish? Shame on us. Yes or no? As we finish, look at the last group. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Love never fails. Notice the grammar. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Notice the word all. You know why? Love is what you are supposed to be doing, what you are not supposed to be doing, and what you are always going to be. What are you always going to be doing? What will you not do? You will not be proud. You will not bear false witnesses, blah, blah, blah. But what will you always do? Bears all things. The word bear all things, the word stego is from the word roof. You bear, you bear it. You don't have to announce the word. The word believes all things. What does it mean, believes all things? You give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, we are so quick to judge. And let me share with you one of the things I'm learning. In my mind, I, you know this, I have a mental file. In that mental file, I put it things I don't understand. Example, you told me you are going to meet me at 3 o'clock. You don't show up. I have two options, to judge your character, or to say, hmm, maybe something happened. I don't know. Just recently, somebody did not show up on Monday. That person is supposed to show up. My wife and I were curious. This person is abusing our hospitality. But you know what? That person has an accident. But I praise God, we did not judge. 
believes. Can you turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I believe you. Honestly, look at me now. I believe you until proven otherwise. I give each other the benefit of the doubt. Really. If something tells me, do you know this person did that? I'll say, I'm sorry. You talk to the person. I will not hear gossip. I will not promote gossip. I will promote truth. Now, if I hear something against you, I will assure you, I'll talk to you. But I will not talk to other people first. Alam mo ba? Hindi nito. Let's pray about it. Huh? mag prayer meeting tayo. Chismis na naman. No? Please don't do that. Okay. Hopes. You know why you can hope all things? Can I tell you why I can hope? Why love is so hopeful? Can I tell you something? You want to know my secret? I believe that God is the only person that can change people. That God is so powerful. God is sovereign. It is not my job to force change. My job is to pray. My job is to love. And my job is to hope. And God's job is to do his part. So what I cannot do, no problem. That is God's department. Are you familiar with Philippians chapter 1, verse 6? Look, let's read this together. I am confident of this very thing. I am confident that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The Bible says, Paul is saying, I am so confident of this one thing. And I'm telling you right now, he who began a good work in your life, God will complete it. Are your works in progress? Yes or no? Tell your neighbor, be patient with me. Be patient with me. God is not true with me yet. Be patient with me. God is not true with me yet. My ladies and gentlemen, what are we learning today? Love is action. What kind of action? Love is long suffering. Love is patient. Yes or no? Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love is what? It's not what? What have we learned so far? Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. You see, my friend, I want you to rate yourself right here. I want you to tell me which one is the lowest. As of now, as of now, which one is the lowest? Now, before I say goodbye to you, love believes all things, hopes all things. Your favorite word that you need to learn in CCF is the next word, hupomeno. Love endures. Everybody read, hupomeno. Endure. What is endure? Endure is not ititiis ka po ito. No, no, no. Endure is more than tiis. Endure is Bearing the load with positive expectation. Hupo, under, meno, to remain. You remain where you are with the strength of the Lord and you look up to God. Lord, what do you want to accomplish? It's called endurance. You will miss God's plan for your life if you are not able to endure persevere. You know why? God will never fail. Love never fails. Another way to understand what love is, you summarize this in one sentence. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, what is love? Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let me explain to you. We have a close friend, my wife and I, who told us what happened to her husband. It's one thing to discover your husband is unfaithful. It's another thing, after confronting your husband, you tell your husband, can you promise not to see her again? And your husband were to tell you, I cannot make that promise. Ladies, what will you do? Will you bear 
Will you still believe there's hope in your family? Will you hope that he will change? Will you endure? You see, her best friend told her, divorce him. If you don't divorce him, you are enabling him to keep on committing adultery. When she came to us, our counsel was different. I said, you ask God to change him. And you ask God to give you the strength. And I told her, I don't think he is a Christian. She said, yeah, but he attended discipleship training. He attended this. I said, no. Treat him like a non-Christian. Be nice to him. Would you believe it? Many years later. Now, this went on around for over 20 years. I'm telling you, love is patient. She told this girl, the wife, the reason why God convicted me is because of your love. You never kicked me out. I was hoping you would kick me out. Because when you kick me out, I will now have a reason to stay with that girl. But you were so nice. You were so loving. And I discovered I am not a Christian for the last 20 years. I am a counterfeit Christian. I am a fake Christian. You know, this guy is now a small group leader. Is God amazing, yes or no? My friend, love never fails. But you do not know when God will move. It is costly to love. But it is more costly not to love. You know why? If you don't endure, ladies and gentlemen, you will never know what you would have missed. I was just thinking of many of you. If you had, did not endure, you left your family, I'm just thinking, what will happen to your children? What will happen to your ministry? I have so many pastors in CCF. I look at their marriages today. It's amazing. But if you know their past, I know their past. Disaster. But love is what? Patient. Love is kind. My friend, can I now ask you to complete this? Just check it. And then as you finish this right now, do it. Check it. And then you go home, discuss this with your family members. Ask them if they agree with you. Oh, in my mind, I'm very patient. Ah, they will say, Daddy, no, you're only number two. <laughs> you put there seven. No, no, no. I am very kind. Mommy, that's not true. You put there six, you are only two. Yeah, na kayo. But you cannot fight because it says you will not take a wrong. You understand what I'm saying? You practice this. You know, my prayer is that you will grow in love. And my good news for you, only God can give us his love to love others. And this is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not your own. Amen? So can you imagine if all CCFers, all of us, those of you who are watching us in the video, in the satellite, if all of us will grow every week, every month, let's grow in our capacity to love others. What do you think will happen? Let me tell you what will happen. There will not be enough room to contain people wanting to worship God. Your small group will never be enough. You have to keep multiplying. You know why? We are going to impact this country for Jesus. Yes or no? Not with our words, with our action. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. If God has spoken to you, and you feel like, you know what? I don't have this love. I want to have this love. I need the help of God. You want Jesus to help you. You want to experience the love of God first in your heart. You are being very honest. You have not experienced this kind of love from God. You don't understand the unconditional love of Jesus. But you want to experience His love. Will you raise your hands? Praise God. Higher. I want to pray for you. Those of you who are raising your hands, keep them higher. 
I'm going to pray for you. You pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need your love. I confess I have not experienced this love, and I cannot love others the way you have loved me. I want to experience your unconditional love, unconditional forgiveness. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I invite you today, right now, to take over my heart, to take over my life. Be my Savior. Be my Master. Change me from the inside out. Help me to love others as you want me to love them. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Good day, CCF family, and welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real-life questions and we give you biblical truths. My name is Aika Makazo from CCF Communications, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Peter Tanchi, to answer some of your questions. Pastor Peter, are you ready? I'm ready if you are ready. I'm ready too. Okay. All right, let's go. So for our first question, why does God put such a big emphasis on loving others? Isn't loving God enough? Because God tells us, if you love Him, you will love others. You see, to say love is cheap. Love is action. That's why God says, if you love me, you love others. So the test of loving God is loving others. That's why they go together. You cannot separate the two. Amen. The test of loving God is in loving others. For our next question, the Bible tells us that love doesn't take into account the wrong suffered. So for those watching today might be confused about this verse. Does it mean that we're just supposed to brush our hurts under the rug or ignore our feelings when they're hurt? Don't confuse about sweeping sin under the rug. If I know a brother that's doing something that's not right, it's immoral, what I will do, I will talk to that person privately. Not to take an account of wrong suffered is about personal hurt. And it's true, people do something bad and they hurt us. So what must you do? The Bible is equally clear. Your job is to Forgive. You accept the hurt. You admit the hurt to God. You are not saying what that person did is right. To forgive people is to assume that they really wrong you. You don't forgive somebody if they did not wrong you. So the assumption is they are wrong. But then you are to forgive. That's why forgiveness is very crucial. Forgiveness is on the assumption that somebody has done something wrong against you. But we are commanded, as God has forgiven us, we are to forgive. Now, if God has not forgiven you, don't forgive. I remember somebody said, I will never forgive. And then this scholar said, okay, I pray you will never sin. Okay, you say you will never forgive. I pray for you that you will never sin. Amen. So there is really power in forgiveness. For our next question, prenuptial agreements have been increasingly common in modern marriages. And more than anything else, the recent generation has found it necessary to protect their safety, whether or not they have money. So do prenups or prenuptial agreements have a place in loving and enduring marriages? This is something that I don't want to make a commandment or what. My wife and I, because we love each other, we trust each other, we don't have prenuptial agreement. However, I understand for some people with no biblical background, they want to protect themselves, especially families that are super rich. Personally, I won't do that, but I respect what others will do. It's not a big thing for me. To me, why make it a big deal? If you are the rich one, you like to protect yourself, it's up to you because you can always change it. After you get married, you can adjust your will. I give everything to my wife, nothing wrong, right? And if you are the other party, why do you feel bad? You are there not to get their money. So either way, you love each other. Amen. So there's a lot of discernment in seeking God's will in this. For our next question, there's been a lot of news in the media recently about high-profile and celebrity relationships ending. A lot of our netizens are even dubbing it breakup season. And it's caused many to beg the question, what does it take to make a relationship endure until the end? That's a wonderful question. The only way to make relationship endure, based on my message, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, how can you love? Without the love of God, how can you give love? You cannot give what you don't have. That's why to me, if you want a happy marriage, that's one of the best motivations. You come to Jesus. But more than that, you come to Jesus, not because of what you will get from Him. You come to Jesus because you are a sinner. You come to Jesus because you need a Savior. Amen. And I think that also applies to any relationship we have. So thank you, Pastor Peter, for answering all our questions. But before we go, I would like to invite all the singles who want to know all about life and its seasons of love to join us every Friday, 7.30 p.m. here at the CCF Center or satellites near you for Big Fridays. You may also follow the Big Singles Ministry Facebook page or YouTube channel for updates. I'll be there. I hope to see you there. And that's it for Sunday Fast Track.